Hi. So before I start my talk, I would just like to take a few moments to to pray for our friends who got laid off. Yeah, the last two, three months have been really bad for the tech industry. And just today we heard of probably one of the biggest layoffs in the tech industry at Meta, who's laying off 11,000 people. And it breaks my heart to hear that. And so it, because it was just today, I thought I have a platform where I can reach out to more people and request them to keep these people in their thoughts and prayers, help them as you can. There might be friends, acquaintances among them who are impacted, not just by meta layoffs, but the across the board wide, industry-wide layoffs that are happening. And if either of you needs any help, please do reach out to me. My contact information is in the slides. With that message, let me start with my presentation, which is unrest among the docs. Uh, so uh, if you have read my introduction to the talk, uh, I'll tell you what the unrest means. The unrest here is primarily about what do you do when you have to build a documentation around SDKs, specifically front-end SDKs, which are iOS, Android, uh, Flutter, React, etc. They're just SDKs or plugins which either show a UI to the user or sometimes they don't. They just like perform some functionality, but they are not APIs. So uh, APIs in the sense of like what we traditionally understand as web APIs. And so the tooling around writing such documentation and making it easily understandable, accessible, is really not great out there. Like if you want to start writing documentation for web api you have your open api specs you have your multiple frameworks and tools that help you render uh open api spec to a visually good looking document and there are uh, there are tools that help you like auto generate code on top of them but really like where do we stand with things that are not rest apis so are we going to talk about designing uh, the documentation for a better developer experience based on what to do if the product that you're offering to a technical audience is not REST APIs. And, uh, who this discussion is targeted towards is technical writers because they face this problem almost daily in their lives on how to structure this content, how to put it out in a better way. For designers who are working on information systems or information architecture around the, these documentations, and also like really any developer who just wants to be better at a writing system. Uh, who am I? I'm Akshay, and uh, Rebecca gave a very warm and uh, refreshing introduction. So, my professional interests are around payment systems and developer SaaS. And my personal interests are around my cats. Uh, one is sleeping just right behind me. I'm not sure if they would show up in between, but I would love to be on my desk when I'm working. And I'm also a board games and mechanical keyboard enthusiast. There are links to my social profile on my presentation, which I'll also be sharing the link to. This My presentation is on GitHub, so just uh, you can go and find me there. But you might also be wondering why you should listen to me, because I've seen some not so great things in my life and some great things in my life so uh, i used to be a developer and then i uh, went through a few different roles at different organizations but i've mostly been around startups and technology focused startups specifically api focused startups so yeah you could say that i've i've been seeing a lot of uh, documentation work especially because i work in the solutions and uh, developer experience kind of space. So in case you were wondering why you should listen to a random person. So, okay, cool. Now we'll come to the problem statement. As I described, uh, docs are hard because the primary function is to give information, but it should be readable. It should be easily findable. It should help you with what the steps should be. Again, very contextual information by Ian who was telling us how you should tell the developers about their use cases and how it solves their problem rather than just telling 
my API does this or my SDK does this. That doesn't solve anyone's problem. You should talk to them about what are the steps they should take to solve a particular problem. But at the same time, you have to also be careful not to give out too much information at any single point because too much information can also be overwhelming. And for this reason, you should always expect uh, returning users. Returning users meaning people will keep coming back to your documentation for more information. So you should like really lay out a good map for them to be able to find their way around. And what is even harder is documenting front end SDKs, UI features with version control. By version control, I mean uh, again, working at startups, my experience has been that when something involves a UI, it's really difficult for you to not make intermediate releases. You might have a robust engineering and release process, but at times there are things like uh, something doesn't work on my Android SDK or there's a bug on my React Native SDK, which I need to immediately release a fix for which I cannot coordinate with my other releases going out. And so this uh, feature based release or bug fixes should be version controlled. They should be under a versioning system, but it's very difficult for you to maintain consistency, especially when you are in the early stages of developing a product. And many a times there are breaking changes also. So how do you keep all of this under control? Now, I uh, I'll present you with a few examples of the workplaces that I've worked with and I've tried to how I've tried tackling these challenges and uh, we'll see like what what are some of the good practices that I really do stand behind. So uh, let's start with Razorpay, which is the uh, which is a payment APIs for India. This is what their homepage looks like and. Uh, they have an intro page that helps the reader to navigate to their appropriate section. This is very helpful because a person who lands on their home page doesn't want to do everything at once. So if you would like just help them navigate to the right section, this is where you'll find the web integration documentation or this is where you'll find e-commerce plugins that really helps again this is a more about information architecture than writing the documentation but even with a good writing it's very important to present it in the right way so um, most of my examples would be around how to arrange the documentation rather than how to write them better cool so let's say you clicked on the web integration example uh, so you Low, you land on this section, which is the overview section of that particular integration, but you also see other options visible in your navigation sidebar so that if people change their mind or they feel like they've clicked at the wrong place, they should not feel stuck. So again, navigation is very important part of this. Then uh, when somebody goes on to start building their integration, you, a very good thing we did was to list down the steps first so it's easy for people to navigate it again as i was talking people might come back to look for uh, to look for help again so let's say there are six steps in this and somebody follow through step one two three and then they get stuck at step four they would come back to this page and because they can find the steps right at the top they would be able to easily click and navigate to there Then there's uh, uh, they offer two different kind of uh, integrations. So they've made a helpful table for differentiating what a handler based function and what a callback URL is. Again, like this is contextual information we need to read through the documentation, but just as a screenshot, they provide a clear differentiation on when would you use this rather than telling the users about or the readers about what does a handler function mean or what does a callback url mean they have rather framed it as when would you use this which helps them uh, which helps the readers to make a really easy decision and then uh, in the code samples also 
provided uh, both the code samples with the callback URL and with the handler function so that it's really easy for a developer to follow through with this guide. And there are references for all the parameters that go into this. So uh, uh, if you have to draw certain reference, you can think of them like a Stripe payment API. So uh, let's say on, I don't know how many of you have used a payment a gateway or a payment API before, but the, you have different options of passing how much the amount should be, should the checkout form be shown to the user, or if you already have a saved card, do you want to make a charge to that card? Um, do you want to uh, let the user input their address, et cetera, et cetera, information, which is all configurable. And so the while this is not a part of an API, this is happening on your front end, on your website, but there's still a lot of parameters to configure and they provide a reference for those parameters, which is very important for somebody coming into this kind of ecosystem for the first time to be able to understand. Now, say what happens when we switch to another platform? We were looking at the documentation that was geared towards integrating with a web-based checkout, but we switched to iOS. Now, the structure is very much similar to what we were seeing on the web based this thing. So this, this kind of consistency helps the developers relate back to what they were reading on the other page. And these days, a lot of developers work as full stack or multi-domain experts. So this kind of maintaining readability and consistency across different kinds of frameworks, even on the front end side, really helps because the, it, you, you, what you're doing is lowering the context switching cost for the developers by taking on that additional responsibility at your end. But the things that differentiate one framework from another, which are the platform specific instructions or things that they can do in a iOS IDE, which is Xcode or an Android IE, IDE, which is Android Studio, those kind of things really help because while you're maintaining the structure, you, what you also want to do is to give them contextual information about the environment they are in right now. And uh, uh, there's also callouts, which are used to draw attention to very specific points where uh, one of the callout says, for example, that the API script should not be hard coded in the app. It must be sent from your backend server, which seems like something very basic, but we noticed that people were not doing this and it's a it's a security issue it's a breach because front ends are insecure so we put out this call out so that anyone who's starting to integrate this when they reach this step when they have to use a key based uh, reference we put a put out a call out with a different color right there to warn people that they should not do this on their app Cool. We'll move on to uh, another uh, startup that I was a part of, which is Tight. And uh, we, well, what we did was we took an open source framework, uh, DocuSaurus. We forked it and we created our own customizations on top of it. And we also landed into DocuSaurus Hall of Fame. So you guys can go check it out. This is an open source framework uh, by Tight that uh, is also being used by a couple of other companies too generate their own documents also. I'll talk about what what kind of design uh, slash information choices went behind the idea of when we started doing this work. So again, very similar thing, the landing page shows all the available options. In the SDKs, there is a core and a plugin SDK, both of which do different things. So there's sort of a card layout, which tells you the name and also gives you a one-liner, two-liner description about what this is going to be so you can make that choice right on the home page about which part or which product would you want to use uh, which one fits your use case better and then similarly below that you have different kinds of ui kits using react or html5 uh, web components angular different mobile frameworks android ios all of those things the next thing is uh the the navigation. Now, again, when I was talking about the context switching part, this is uh, one of the things that we really, really wanted to get right. So uh, if you can see in the chip, what is happening is when you switch, 
from one of the UI kits to another, the context remains the same. So the selected page is tight audio visualizer. And even when you switch between different frameworks, it doesn't take you back to the home page. It stays on tight audio visualizer. So for someone who clicked uh, on a wrong page or a wrong UI kit, for example, wouldn't lose their context when they are switching back and forth. If they are trying to say migrate from one framework to another and need to draw a comparison to make it really easy from uh, uh, for them to be able to uh, to be able to cross compare these two different things. And uh, uh, another thing that we wanted to take care of was that people who don't understand uh, what the component means for a certain high level framework should always be able to dive down to the low level framework so if you're reading something in react or angular and it doesn't make sense to you you can immediately switch back to html that's the basic you read that you understand that and then you go back to your react native without losing that context and we are very strong believers in show not tell so we also embedded a live editor in our documentation. So the, for example, in the screenshot, if you can see there are three pictures at the bottom, these are attendees on a live video call. And so if you, if you make changes to the live editor section of the code, you would be able to see those changes being made in this uh, rendering also, which is, which is the, like a very good experience when you are selling a customizable ui to a developer they would want to try it out right there and see if things work or it, if it fits their use case or if they are able to find those customizations that they are looking for with your product with your sdk with your framework before they decide to invest more time into actually going and starting to write out code behind all of this Again, another aspect of show not tell is a visual representation. The colors that we use in our SDK, we've not just written down the particular hex code, but we've also given the full color swatch. And we've also told people how they can customize those colors in their app. And when we talk about particular elements or components on the UI side that we offer through the UI kit, we have actually rendered those components right inside the documentation rather than taking a screenshot so that again developers can get a real actual feel of what this is going to look like when they embed it in their app and so even when we make updates to our sdk they are aligned with this if, you, if it was a screenshot i would probably have to like take a screenshot again of the updated component and replace it in the documentation but using an actual render immediately takes away all of that headache for me. Then another uh, very similar thing that we did for mobile SDKs where you can change the theme uh, is have a code editor on top and show a mobile, uh, show a actual rendering within a mobile screenshot so that people can get an idea of what this would look like if they were to do this on their site then one, uh, another choice that we made here was again since these are very much ui heavy components uh, we decided to instead of building a separate reference page we decided to provide all the relevant information on the same page so again uh, as we were seeing this diet audio visualization uh, audio visualizer component what happens is you have all your props and uh, all your uh, parameters on the same page along with their definitions default values etc so that you don't have to go back and forth or look up some other place to see what this would look like or what all can you customize or what does that particular property mean for this particular component mm -hmm. yeah so another very similar example for a meeting component what would it look like for a participant component, what would it look like? So have all the relevant information in a single page. Now I 
talked about one of the principles which was not to overwhelm people with a lot of information which is where the right side navigation also comes into the picture the left side navigation is the main nav which shows you where do you want to land on the docks and the uh, right side navigation helps you with where do you want to land on this page which is uh, divided into clear sections but that doesn't mean that we do not provide them a reference page separately there are also reference pages for when you want to look up something very quickly you don't want to waste your time going through the full thing you directly land up on the reference page find your particular element on the right side menu click that and you go and read it that's just it without wasting any time without having for, to look for it again then this this is again one of the things that we felt very proud doing which was uh our we also try to explain our design philosophy behind building a lot of these components and uh, explaining explaining designs to developers was a very delightful experience even when we were writing these docs and we were thinking about what would people take away from this and what kind of impression do we want them to take home even if they don't understand what design means but we still want them to be to to be able to understand the kind of love that we gave to this project we want them to be able to have a basic understanding of what they are using how it's been built and how they can make a better use of that so this this was a really fun part next we'll come to philo which is where i currently work at and uh, we offer uh, data APIs for the digital economy. So for creators who are working across different platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, whatever. So we offer unified APIs to be able to access data from these kind of platforms. Now, again, I just start with the navigation part, abstracting out all the other information. So as you can see from this screenshot, there's a very separate, uh, there's a very clear demarcation to separate out the sections for introduction, the SDKs, the APIs. And then there are a few developer guides also below that. So the idea behind having this demarcation is that the, the, the person who's going to land on this documentation, if they know what they're doing, they should be able to immediately find and land on the uh, page that they're looking for. If they don't, then introduction is the best place for them to start. But rather than having to choose or guess which place to start with or how can I get started with something, we've tried to keep it very simple and clear. Also for uh, different stages of development or different uh, backend versus frontend engineers, it's not uh, easy at all in some of the documentations that I've come across. To see like this this is the part that you should be doing on your server and so probably a backend engineer or a backend person should be involved with this and so we try to make those things clear right in the beginning then one of the things that we do is because this is a very domain specific uh, uh use case driven api we give a glossary towards the beginning in the introduction section so that people who are landing here for the first time may or may not be aware about the terminology that we use and again it's not uh, it, it's not just the industry terminology it's also about how we have structured or named certain things in our apis or in our documentation so it's really important for us to educate people about uh, these terminologies then uh, again one of the things that we did was to add visual indicators now this is again uh, very basic something that if you're offering a ui either you show them a render like we did for the documentation of uh, at type of the different components or because we are offering an sdk which is like not a single component it's a, it's a full-fledged sdk that comes on screen and the user has to interact with it so we show the indicators of what it would look like with the help of a screenshot and again we mark out the different sections as you can see there are like orange color arrows and blue color arrows so the blue color arrows represent what 
philo does or what part philo sdk plays in this uh, whole transaction and the orange arrows are what the developer of the app has in their control uh, another example of showing visual reference to the components is like we again offer few customizations on our uh, SDK, but we don't know there are things that we are calling as a title or a logo or an accent color, but we don't know if the reader is on the same context as us. So we make it really easy for them to find out on what places is this accent color used on what places in the SDK does this logo appear. When we say title, what do we actually mean by that? When we say name of the app, what is the placement that we are going to give to that name? So it's really easy for the developers uh, and even uh, product managers or de uh, designers or whoever is involved in this process to take easy decisions on what color do they want to show here rather than just saying, hey, you can set your accent color we show them that this is where the color that you're going to tell us is going to be used. Uh, okay, so again, back to navigation, there's a clear distinction between web-based integration and mobile-based integration, which we found out through a couple of not so great experiences uh, that uh, because we previously had them under, similar, uh, in, under a single section that people do get confused because of overlap of technology. JavaScript is now omnipresent and is being used not only for web-based frameworks, but also mobile. And then React and React Native are also sometimes quite easy to confuse. So then what we decided was to put them in separate sections so that this confusion does not arise again. Uh, again, we provide two choices. Uh, of integration even in our web-based flow so there's a whole page dedicated to explaining what these two choices are which one should you use what are the advantages and in each scenario what are we able to support and what are we not able to support so this if somebody does not want to read about what these two choices mean for them they can simply skip to which one should you choose section and they will be able to find the comparison and highlight the differences and the, the the most common misunderstanding is again where they've used a call out section with a different color to grab the attention of if you want to do this you should definitely take this path and when people click on that link in in the call out they are taken to a separate page where we explain again about why this misunderstanding occurs and what you should do about it and we uh, try to explain things as well as possible now again the 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 reason that i'm emphasizing on this is there's also a lot of times where developers would be interested in knowing more about certain choices that you've made with your product why things are working in a certain way and so it's really useful or helpful for the uh, for you to give them that information to for them to be able to make more informed choices but the first priority should be to let them know what they should do and only if they are interested in finding out more about it they can click through another link and then land on this page which tells them or explains things in a better way then a very similar choice that we made was to keep the steps same across different frameworks so if you look at the steps that are highlighted for integration between an android sdk a ios sdk a web sdk steps look very similar so if it's a single developer working across different frameworks it would be really helpful for them to be able to switch between these different contexts if the, uh, if they even don't know how to write android code or what the structure of an Android app should look like, but they are aware of how it works on a web or JS based SDK. They can simply switch to the Android page, follow the same steps and copy paste the code. That's it. They would not need to spend any additional mental bandwidth in, uh, in, in understanding why this step is happening. Change logs, again, very important. 
so uh, we maintain a change log for all our uh, releases and as in when applicable we also let people know about breaking changes and what they should do to upgrade to those changes now these are all the examples of things that i have helped uh, build or help influence in a lot of ways i would also like to pick up some examples of how i have seen other uh, developer focused product companies give it a go so uh, the first thing that came to my mind is because i was talking about front end frameworks uh, i i tried to check what the most popular front end frameworks for modern apps are using and the first thing that i went to was react js website and it it was really unappealing in in a very uh, how i would say that it's it's not something that stands out immediately but i still love few of the choices that they made if especially the left side navigation bar where they have the home learn and api section so what this helps is like all your navigation is really consolidated into a single place where you have search you have different sections for the api reference uh, the learn section takes you through some uh, tutorials and it's really unimpressive but it does the job so well so that it's impressive then i went to view js which uh, i think is another very common web framework and i was really not impressed because their website just seemed like a wall of text like you have to just read 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 and understand things and this is definitely not a choice that i would make with any of the documentation i am writing i don't understand these frameworks very well to be able to comment whether this is the best choice they could have made given their constraints but visually and for a newbie like me to find out more information this did not uh, this did not look appealing at all then i try to find like what are some other visual libraries doing so there's this animation library by airbnb called lotti and uh, again this is something that i did not like very much and i would uh, think that people should avoid doing this which is to say there's so much text on their page and this is a library that has been used to build animations so they could really use some more visual element to this uh, going with the uh, going with the philosophy of show not tell while you're documenting what this particular method does and how it helps with the animation just putting a small sample of how it actually runs or how it actually works would go a long way than just like writing a page full of this uh, the methods and method references uh, this one uh, auth0 is a provider of uh, login and identity management solutions and i really like how many uh, starter kits and guides for different frameworks they provide so there's not just android there's android plus facebook login so they they go like that deep that specific to the use case to say that if you're using this plus this this is the guide you should follow and then they have also like probably outdated frameworks but still people are using it which is uh, the windows uh, universal windows platform and the windows forms on mobile so they they do offer a lot of diversity on that front and even on their web app side things like asp.net core mvc which is something I don't think a lot of startups think about these days because we're more into modern languages like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Node.js. Probably we get to Java or PHP somewhere, but having documentation specifically for ASP.NET frameworks, etc., is what I found really impressive. Then uh, this interoperability between different frameworks is something that I find really good with agora agora is also one of the dites competitors who does real time audio and video so you can really switch between a mac os a windows a flutter and a react native implementation without losing the context if you are on the ui kit page you would stay on the ui kit page if you are on uh, any like whichever component or whichever page you select 
and you ch uh, change the framework, you would not lose context at all. So again, it helps with comparing the features, deciding what kind of things can you build on top of it. Would it be available on this platform or not available on this platform without losing a lot of context or spending time in trying to find out whether it happens or not. And the last example I would like to talk about is uh, the love of all documentation geeks, Stripe. Uh, so uh, the thing about Stripe is very similar to what uh, the kind of problem that I'm trying to address where they offer front-end components also for the integration. And between their front-end components also there is two choices between a pre-built UI solution and they offer something called Stripe elements which are just components that you can build on top of. So here is how they choose to document both. The elements features have a landing page for themselves and they give the most common options for the uh, reader to uh, to read further about and these common options i'm guessing they must have found out through their usage through their early adoption patterns on this is what people like to read when they come to our mobile elements page for example this is what they like to read and so they've just Put those two links over there so if you don't find what you're looking for in those links you can keep scrolling further and again it why it works so well is because they provide you with a live code integration walkthrough so they have they've given the full code which you can simply copy paste or download and start running on your own system without changing anything with it so this really helps in uh, in people understanding what what code to write and how it would work and if you're not satisfied with just seeing say kotlin code written on a website you could always just copy it and run it in your own project and it works so you have to uh, really craft out your code samples also carefully so as to make sure that if somebody is just doing a copy paste they should be able to run it with minimal changes and like make sure to highlight that this is the place where you should make change in your code. For example, if you're using a key, just highlight that part saying change this key to your key to make it work. And it's a very similar experience for the pre-built checkout section also. And uh, uh, yeah, so one of the choices that they have made is that the options on the payment screen are controlled by an api request rather than from the front end so when you are doing the checkout integration that part is already taken care of by running some business logic on the back end because your api is the one controlling it and uh, all of this hand holding again doesn't mean that they don't provide references for different languages for different sdks they provide complete references for their uh, SDKs so that people who are interested to uh, study further or people who are interested to just like find new use cases on top of it, find different ways of using it, they, they should be able to do this. So coming to the end, uh, usually slides have a conclusion at the end, but I don't, I, I really don't. I don't know if there are some good rules or guidelines to writing documentation for a front-end SDK, which involves a UI element, which doesn't involve a UI element, because as I see and as I've experienced with my own work also, it's all very contextual. And uh, we have to make decisions based on certain principles that we abide by. And these are my principles that I think about the user. I think about what matters to them to find out I try not to overwhelm them with a lot of information. I give them information, but not all at one go. Keep it accessible so that when they are ready for it, when they are uh, ready to look for it, they can search for it easily. And try making it as interoperable as possible because really the boundaries for developers are expanding. And while in a traditional world, you would expect a backend engineer to be separate from a front-end engineer, we have full stack and now days we also have like front-end full stack which is a, the same developer can build a web app 
an Android app, a iOS app using React or React Native or even Native. So make it as simple as possible for them to be able to interoperate or understand. If they understand one part well, they shouldn't really be having to use their brain a lot to understand the other one like the understanding should happen just once the other part should be a breeze as hey this looks exactly the same as what i did with the previous one and i wish there were some standards some uh some guidelines for putting this in place and i don't know what the right answer here is probably we as community can collaborate come up with something across this but across different languages frameworks ui components i really feel need, we need a unified standard on how to write these documentations while we very helpfully have open api spec for writing uh, rest apis we also have a uh, graphql uh, explorer uh, type of standards for how to write a good graph api i don't think we really do have anything great for a front-end based sdk for ui components i've seen a lot of people uh, using playbook uh, JS, yeah, if I'm if I'm remembering the name right, so it it helps you to sort of uh, give that live editing or a playground sort of feel. But again, that's a way of a representation. That's not really documentation. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And my slides are available on my GitHub page. The links are here. Uh, my social handles are here. If you have any questions, I can try answering them now. We do have questions for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, even though you said you have no conclusions, I love the conclusion. So, <laughs> and I think your cats uh, agreed, or at least they have a lot to say. And they're so cute the way they keep talking to you while you're talking. I think they might have thought you're talking with them. Um, so, um, while the audience questions are being gathered. So there was the question about Docosaurus, but I would ask that you uh, talk that through in the chat because that is uh, a tooling question, not particularly relevant to your point here in this presentation. Sure. Absolutely, um, yes. I really, really liked how you kept emphasizing the, the context um, to keep the context change light or don't keep change the context at all. And I can attest to that as a, as a user on any site, anywhere, ever, not just APIs, that that's okay. very important. Um, and the, the love of all documentarians tribe, mm, let me do some advertisement. So one of the lead technical writers, uh, Leah Tucker, is uh, uh, one of the jurors for the Deaf Portal Awards this year. And she obviously had a lot to say. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that um, I think she will mention um, is you were showing the code samples highlighted. And she was right. saying she finds it particularly important that um, to pay attention that those highlights, that the contrast ratio, that you pay attention to that, that once it's highlighted, you can still read it. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's just a tidbit that um, now I can offload from my memory because I shared it. So. Um, let's see what the audience wants to ask. My colleagues are bringing it. And I hope that uh, Dight would maybe nominate um, for the Deaf Portal Awards next year. We have a category um, beyond REST APIs. And okay. uh, this is one of the parts where uh, this becomes particularly interesting. So where there are no standards yet or not, well, the expectations are totally there, but how do you present it so that people know instinctively or habitually what to look okay. for, what to look for? That's very interesting. Yeah. I think it will just take time for this kind of uh, problem itself to mature because we haven't seen a lot of tools like this. The, when we talk about developer SaaS or developer tooling, either it's tools that developers themselves use, something like a Postman, which a developer would individually use in their workflows or a, uh, a tool chain or a build system. That's one part. The other one is really web APIs. I don't think we have enough uh, productized SDKs out there, front-end SDKs, uh, which do uh, which to start a healthy conversation among the industry on, hey, this problem looks like it's getting out of hand and we should really try to address this just like it happened with the apis a few years ago 
that when the API markets really started booming around 2012, 2013, people realized that unless we all can agree on something similar, it's going to be really messy. And so the swagger spec, the API specs were born. So that's just like my personal thought that in the SDK space, I don't think that we we have seen that much implosion yet for people to be saying that this is a problem that really needs addressing. But mm -hmm. because it's my job to work in this domain, I have been really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And the um, the practices that you were explaining how to how to present this well to to consider the user. How do you follow up? What do you measure to know that your thoughts are indeed? How do you prove that this was the right way? What what are you checking? How do you get a feedback yeah. on? Right. So uh, there's a couple of things that we do. First is when we come up with our design mockups. I obviously work with a UX designer. I'm not somebody who would be very comfortable around design tooling and how what to do the right thing. So we really like to do a lot of back and forth. So between myself and a design expert, we do come up with a few mockups and do a few user interviews where we ask our existing customers or potential customers to say, hey, we are working on making our documentation better. If you could just spare 20 minutes of your time to take a look at this and tell us if this would work better. So that's one thing that we do before release. After release, what we try to do is to really uh, try to measure the number of support requests that we're getting around our uh, doc, our products, our info, technical information that we think that is already present on the docs should have been easily accessible. Or if, if somebody really went there and tried to find it, they would have found it. But because they haven't, that means that we haven't done a good enough job. So what can we do to iterate on this? So every question, every support ticket, every I don't know, a uh, Slack ping from one of your customers if you're working in shared channels. All of that is very important to monitor. There might be some false signals where you would be like, probably this person just like didn't put enough effort in finding this. But a lot of times you also get useful signals. So uh, keep iterating using these two mechanisms. Like if, when you start building out something, check with a few users, make, uh, make changes, release it. After release, monitor whether the problems have been solved or if you're uh, receiving less number of queries than before. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the um, show, don't tell, especially, I especially really like that idea of visually pointing out the thing that you name, as in this is the title or whatever you're talking about. Right, right. How does that? How does that play together with the um, accessibility uh, rules or that are becoming the law uh, in the European yeah. Union, in Canada, in US, the federal government is enforcing it also. Hmm. There's some hardships there. I mean, I, I, I would like to support both. Where do you make them meet? Very honestly, I haven't thought uh, very much about accessibility, but now that you put across this question the thought that comes to my mind is it it wouldn't just start with the documentation mm -hmm. it would need to start with the product itself whether my product is accessible or not and then i would want to bring that into the documentation and uh, this particular thing of labeling the images like particular components of the images is uh, not something that i can think is easily solvable, but I would again like to learn from more people around how they're solving these kind of accessibility uh, mm -hmm. issues. I guess it's like you put them all together. It does help cognitive accessibility, at least for me. Right. Um, what is the thing that you don't find yet solvable? Because the times are not ripe for it, but you would you could very well imagine that that's if only we could do that you would love to see that solution in documentation um beyond the standards uh, <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's the only thing that goes on in my mind as of now that if we could all agree on certain ways of implementing this i mean we do have uh things like a js talk or something right where you could 
write the reference of the method right on top of the method, but that doesn't do justice for where UI elements are involved. Mm -hmm. And for UI elements, if you just give like a show don't tell kind of thing, that doesn't uh, justify on when you, you have to like put more controls on the developer side. Like there are these eight properties that you can play around with. Now in a show don't tell, you would usually like give them a toggle or you, you would just list down the eight properties and say, change these values and see what happens. But you also need to tell them what this particular thing does, what it means, and in what use cases would you try to probably tweak these values? Because like one of the things I was showing in the type documentation was the audio visualizer, mm -hmm. which tells you the level of audio. You, you notice that small thing in your mic that goes up and down, mm -hmm. the audio energy level or where you muted. So it's, you don't just have to tell them what you can, change in the audio visualizer you also have to tell them when you are using it along with a video or audio component this is when you would want to change the value okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question but uh, that, that like the, these are the kind of things uh, so your question was what would you love other than standards which you already mentioned and my answer to that is I don't know right now. The thing that I keep thinking the most about is how can I standardize this? How can I make this as easily reproducible across different kind of products and different kinds of SDKs, different kind of contexts as possible? And that will make consistency so much easier. Yes. Thank you okay. very much. Uh, also Thanks. for, I assume, staying up so late to hold this presentation. Not a problem at all. And uh, my greetings to your cat from a fellow cat owner. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. See you on the stage uh, when uh, the standards are bubbled up to the surface. Uh, I'd absolutely be love to be there and contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you.